Okay, so we are all set with this YouTube thing, and then let's start with the lesson. I'm pretty excited to, to be your guide through this Modern C++ course this year. It's going to be a bit challenging since uh, we never did this before, like doing these online lectures. But I think it's it's going to work out for for both for you and for and for me as well. So um, this year, because of the coronavirus thing, um, we can't teach you C++ on the classroom. But I I feel like this is uh, good news for everyone because I never felt like teaching coding on a classroom. So it's quite difficult. It's like for me, it's like if I would be trying to teach like 10 people how to ride a bike in a classroom. So it's quite challenging. So of course we can explain some theory facts and some ideas, but maybe the most important thing is that you need to get your hands on the keyboard and start coding. Okay, so let's get started. Let's discuss a bit about the course, or, or course organization. So we will have like lectures every Wednesday at 4 p.m. on Central European time. So this is in Germany. So this is basically this lecture. And this is this is going to be once a week. So every Wednesday I will be trying to give you a lecture of not more than one hour. Uh, that's my idea. So you, you commit yourself, you put effort one hour and then you learn something. So we have um, we have lecture videos that I will point you with the link. Um, um, but the thing is why I'm, I am... I'm sorry, I need to check the chat. Okay. I'm sorry, yes, I'm not a YouTuber. Okay, great. Um, why we don't, I don't want to do this offline video thing? It's because I want to give you guys the feel like you are going to the university. So that's why also some of the colors of the layout of the video. So the idea is to is that you commit to go to lectures every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Uh, of course, I need to put extra effort to do this, and I expect that you also put extra effort during the homeworks. So this is going to be like 10 lessons uh, where I will try to explain you guide you through the topics and do some live coding examples and then we have a tutorials every friday but this is not going to be like a lesson where i will be i will not be doing this live stream thing um, um but i will be basically online on the discord channel in case anyone has any question uh we can discuss it through there also on the discord channel i can share you my screen so if there are like some question i can say okay let me share you the screen and i will show you how to fix some issue or whatever and also you will so you you should reserve this spot for yourself because i will be giving you videos that i will be recording myself and also videos from other people that you will you should like watch to these videos on this time slot and then if you haven't already just please sign up to the discord channel so this is the fastest channel to discuss for many reasons please if you have a question that you think that someone else might benefit from the answer just ask on the channels so we have a lecture channel to discuss stuff about this for example you say i hate this youtube live stream it doesn't work for me then you go to the lecture channel on discord and you say hey guys what do you think do you think we should use zooms like this other guy is using zoom it's much better than this this youtube live stream whatever if you, if you have any issue with the homeworks you will go to the homeworks channel and say i am starting with homework number two uh blah 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 and then we can discuss everything there like as a group and this will allow me to give you one answer for all of you guys and of course i'm I am working from home, so I'm basically always online. So if, if, you, if you are struggling with something and I am online in that moment, I can help you uh, to sort uh, the issue. Just uh, be aware that I'm currently in Argentina, my home and lovely country. And there, there is five hours difference with Germany. I have no idea where you guys are, at, but with Germany, there is five hours uh, difference. So make sure you sign up to the Discord channel. 
Okay, this is for me important for you because this is some numbers that not everyone see. If you look to the study plan of this course, you will have these numbers and I did the math for you. And then let's try my new magic tool. Okay, apparently it's working. Um, so in this particular year, these 60 hours per semester on lectures, this is more or less the time we spend during le uh, doing lectures during a normal semester. So in this case, you will have to spend these 60 hours in the whole semester with my YouTube videos and all the recommendations I will give to you. And then if you do the math, you will have basically eight hours a week. What is the meaning of this? Is that at least you need to spend one full day working on the C++ homeworks plus the lectures and the tutorials and whatever. So if you want to make a schedule for yourself, you can say, okay, every Thursday I will work from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on the C++ homeworks. Depending on, on the background you have, if you know, if you knew C++ before or whatever, you will probably need to spend extra time. But this is basically the minimum requirement. So it's very unlikely that you get through this course just spending two hours a month. So it's one day uh, per week for the C++ course. So one of the basics that you will be learning in this course is how to work on a Linux environment. Uh, this is super important. How to write software with modern C++ and some core software development techniques. So this is not a programming course. It's not a pattern course. So it's not going to be uh, sufficient if you want to learn this but we will discuss some small points. And also we will be dealing with OpenCV, that is an open source library to work with images. And then the final project is basically doing this inverse image search that you can check that link that is basically to see a working example, but we will adapt this idea and try it on our field, that is the robotics field. And we will build a place recognition pipeline, sort of, uh, using inverse image search. Okay, this year I also spent some extra time trying to sort the contents of the course to make it easier for you. Uh, this doesn't mean that it's extremely easy, but I spent a lot of time trying to make the, put the topics from the, the easiest to the hardest. So. If you, if you see the, this is the schedule. So all this information is on the webpage of the course. Um, so you can go and check it out, but it's basically in four parts. So the first part is basically the tools. So this year I decided to completely remove whatever is uh, related with tools from the lectures. This means that I will not be discussing uh, how to build a project during the lectures because that's not the key concepts of the class, but then we will move this to tutorials. So all the first part that is basically how to build projects, how to use Linux and all this part will be part one of the course that is basically the tools. So this is the tools you need to know in order to work with the concepts, right? But then the concepts also need uh, like their own uh, place in the course. So then we have two extra parts. That is basically part two. I call it the C++ core language. And it's basically four weeks. This means one month. Then if you complete this part, let's say, there is no real examination between parts. So it's just uh, uh, like a scheme to make it easier for you. So if you complete part two, that is the core language then you will probably know how to code in C++, stuff that you already know how to code in a language like, let's say, Python or MATLAB. So it's basically the, 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 the simply, the core language is what I call like, what you can do with all languages as well in C++. And then the third part is gonna be the modern C++, that this is the, the meaty part of the course that is basically, don't mention Hava in my course. I'm watching the, the chat. The, um, the, um, the modern C++ part is the meaty one, I was saying. 
that is uh, the things that you will be able to code in C++, but you cannot code in other languages, or it's the most fancy part of the course, I would say, and also the most complex part. In previous year, we used to explain some of these topics around the semester, and but this year I tried to make it like from easy to hard level uh, when I made the scale. And then the, the final part is gonna be the final project. That is this, basically you will have one lecture on the concepts behind the final project you need to implement. And then you will have no lectures because you need to, to do the project yourself. And also one thing I, we are doing this year, so you, you don't complain, there is a lot of homework some of the homeworks during these nine homeworks will be related to the final project. What is the meaning of this? So if you complete, let's say, homework number five and you do it properly, then you have 10% of the final project already done. So I will not recommend you to do some stuff that I know students do. That is like I do the 50 points and then I quit until the final project because during the homeworks, you will be also implemented implementing tasks from the final project. So this will give you the ability to, to complete this final project in less time. The course content, so this is basically the topics. This you can also check on the web page. Um, I just put this on the web page for people who is curious and wants to know what we will be learning during this semester. Then the philosophy of this course, and for this, I will ask you to help me, is that this famous quote that is say, talk is cheap, show me the code. So sometimes in coding, not in C++, but in every language, so we, people can spend hours talking about like one particular thing, but then when you see the code is super simplistic and then it's, it's faster to just see the code, and discuss, discuss about the code without like too much talk. So that's the philosophy. This is what I expect you to do in this course. So you should get your hands dirty. You should be hours on the keyboard, trying stuff uh, in order to make it work. So you, you, you will get your hands dirty. And then I have a disclaimer here that is that I will ask you to stop me if you don't understand anything, but I also need to ask you that don't be surprised if I do something fast. It's not because I am smart or because blah, blah. It's because I have been using Linux, for example, for more than 10 years. So I am really used to this. And sometimes for me, it's really difficult to not do the stuff I'm used to do. So if you see that I did something funky, you say, wait a moment, I have no idea what are you doing. You just open this, but blah, blah, blah. Just go to the chat and say, Nacho, stop. What are you doing? I would try to go slow, but I am really used to type on the keyboard, so I might be a bit fast, but this doesn't mean that you should be scared or say, oh, why no, this is like so complicated. He's doing it really fast. It's just because I have been doing this for 10 years. So may, make yourself, so I want to make this clear. And also, I usually try to use like a modern uh, desktop environments to, to, to show you how to use Linux and whatever. But currently I'm, I only have a dual core machine from, and it's five years old. So I cannot run like really heavy desktop environments like GNOME or uh, Unity, whatever. So I am running a tiling window manager that is called iFree. And if you see it, it might be like hacky or whatever. I don't recommend you to use this, but I just want to mention that uh, you can make your computer look much more beautiful than my computer. So don't be scared uh, for that. Why? So I also made a, a frequent uh, questions and answers on the um, on the modern C++ website. I will recommend you to go there and check it out. It's on the website, you go to the fact uh, tab and then there you have the answers. But then here we will, I will try to motivate you to, to why you should use in C++. I know that some of you uh, only want to know C++ because it's part of the, your study program, but believe me, it's a really fun topic. 
it's a really fun language when you learn it properly. So when I was designing this part of the class, I wanted to show you millions of things of why you should learn C++, but then I decided to make it more simple and then encourage you to, to go and look on Google, YouTube, whatever, why you should be learning C++. So before you start learning, you, sh you should ask yourself this question and then do some research on, on the language itself. So this is from 2018, but here are some of the numbers of the survey from Stack Overflow. So most of you might already know Stack Overflow. So it's basically a forum where people ask questions about coding. And then every, every year they do this survey where they ask like most of the programmers in the world, let's say, uh, which tools they use, which environment they use and whatever. And then the results from the, some key results, because it's a big survey, I would recommend you to go and check it out, is uh, that nearly half of the people who are professional developers are using Linux as the primary system for working. And then this was in 2015, C++ was the most used system language with almost 5 million users. Uh, so C++ is still super popular. Nowadays we have all languages that are uh, a bit more popular like Python, let's say, but this is also because Python uh, can be used for more people. But then you, you need to keep in mind that we are trying to target C++ for robots. And then if you go for robotics, the robotics field, then you will not find like many Python or whatever other languages working there. So make sure that when you see these surveys and comparisons, make sure that you, you know what you're checking. Because of course you, you will see, I know JavaScript, like the most used language, but everyone is doing web development. So it's not really fair if you trade it against JavaScript because it's, it's a different monster. So all of the companies in our field will want you to know C++. And also if you don't plan to go for, for the industry and you plan to do research, it's really important that you know C++ in terms of it's really good if you can run experiments and don't need to wait like for three months in order to get the results of these experiments. So with C++, it's not the best language for prototyping, but once you have the ideas, it's really fast. So one of the key ideas of C++ is that it's super fast and this is why we use it in our field. Another reason is that uh, nowadays, so maybe 10 years ago when people were talking about, okay, let's say uh, a few bytes of memory, uh, people start laughing because it was the age where people start getting like 12 gigabytes of memory RAM on the computers. But then the, the game changed because then the computers stopped being only on your desktop and then started to be on your smartphone, on your watch and on your robots and everywhere. So then the power consumption and the footprint of the processors you put on these devices start. Uh, so the weight of this start to matter and then people stop laughing about like memory efficiency and all this stuff. And this is why still C and C++ are one of the most popular language out there. Uh, not because you want to, to save like uh, time on your desktop machine or memory on your machine, but because you want to probably run this software in embedded devices where you don't have like infinite amount of resources and then every bit matters here. And even when you say, I don't care, I have money, I can pay more like a bigger processor, whatever, then you will need to pay energy consumption and then you will need to put a bigger battery on your device. So this is where the trade off like say you could stop. And then this is where like compile languages like C or C++ start to, to have really importance. These are some of the companies that I know they use C++. So it's not, not like a, a weird language that no one use. So Google, Microsoft, all of them use C++. This doesn't mean that they use C++ for everything, but we know for a fact that they, they use C++ and also they, they are part of the people. So they have people who 
uh, invest time on, on making C++ a better language. Some browsers that use C++, Firefox, Chrome, if you check the source for these uh, browsers, they are all written in C++. Also, there is some software that is written primarily in C++, like the Java virtual machine, uh, some part of the Windows operating system, Office, Photoshop, many of them. And there's also a big part of the game industry that uses C++ as primary languages. So this is one of the, some, some games that we know that are written in C++. Okay, so let's um, see a bit of history of C++. So basically when we start having computers on, on our life, we have this beautiful language I love that is called assembly. And one of the benefits is like, there are really simple instructions uh, for this language to program computers and it's super fast when it's well written and then you will have complete control not over just your program but also the hardware and then if you check these benefits you will say okay this is the language we should be using as humans to program computers why don't we use this always so let's check how the hello world example looks so this is a program that you need to run or write in assembly in order to write hello world to your uh, screen so of course it's quite difficult to read and it's not straightforward like what is doing when you see the program and then you will have a lot of code to do really simple tasks like this hello world it's really hard to understand and the thing about assembly is that it strictly depends on the processor you are targeting so the assembly language will be different from uh, um, a AMD processor than uh, Intel processor. So this is one of the biggest drawbacks. And that's why people came up with the idea of getting a better language like C. And then they say, okay, so computers will only understand assembly. And then this is actually not extremely true. Computers only understand binary code, but assembly is really easy to translate to binary code. And then why the idea is like why don't we write code in a more intuitive language and then we add an additional program that this program we will call the compiler that transforms this source code on the high level language to assembly language and that's how they came up with C. So these are uh, Kenny and Enrici, the creators of C. This this happened in 1972, so a long time ago. And then they made this language that was super fast, simple, and cross-platform. So you don't need to, to know your, archi your architecture anymore. And then C was super popular because it was easy to use, but also was part of the weakness of the language. So we, they didn't have object or classes. It's difficult to write code that, was, that worked generically. And was, it's super tedious nowadays still to write large programs. So C is still one of the most used programs, uh, programming languages out there. But my expectation is that people start to move to C++ just because it's a better language. So then this guy called Björn Storstrup, there is a Danish guy, super cool guy. 40 years ago, he invented the C++ language where he wanted to take all the benefits from C, like it was fast, cross platforms, easy to use, but add more high level uh, semantics into the language. So he wanted a language that was super fast, simple to use and cross platforms, but with, have, sorry, with high level features, like using classes, objects, generic programming, and so on. And this is basically the full story of C++ up to today. So there is also a question on the fact on the website about what is modern C++ and what is not modern. But basically, we will say that whatever is after C++ 11, that is basically the standard that came after 2011. Uh, this is what we call modern C++. I mean, if you use lang language features, features from these uh, standards, and wherever it's before C++11, we will call just C++. Particularly, in our course, we will be using 
uh, this standard that is C17 that is a standard that they released on 2017 and has uh, a lot of modern features as, as a language. Nowadays they are still working on the C20 standard but this is not, as far as I know, they will release this in two weeks or so. But we will know not use uh, C20 features because they are not fully supported in compilers. So the design philosophy of C++ is basically to be multi-paradigm and this is not only to be a object-oriented language or a procedural-oriented language is to support different paradigms and then express ideas and intent directly in code. So this is super important for me because I probably some of you learn how to program using C from our language where in these languages when you want to express ideas in code is really difficult so how people sort this out this problem with comments so up to i know before uh, c11 let's say people were like super fun on like putting comments everywhere it was the default so comment your code because blah 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 and then there the it start people started to think about it and they say probably it's better that if your code is easy to read then you need the comments and then if you have like a really hacky instruction that no one can read and then up this instruction you need to put like 50 lines of comments then it's probably a bad idea or a bad design so for us it's really important in this course that you try to express ideas and the intent of your code in the code and not in the comments and C++ will give you the tools to do this and this is why C++ it's a better language modern C++ also C++ will be super safe when used wisely and will be extremely efficient and then will give you the abstraction uh, layer that we call this zero cost abstraction that is basically uh, use some high level features of the language without paying the price at runtime this means your program will run slower or at memory footprint. This means your program needs more memory. And then about efficiency. So still nowadays, sadly, a lot of people argue that C is faster than C++. And most of these people is because they don't know how to use C++ and they are not probably using the right tools or the right compiler. So it's extremely difficult to beat C++ in terms of efficiency when you use wisely. So make sure you keep this in mind, C programmers. Okay, so this is part of the tools, like we will be using GNU slash Linux distributions on this course. Um, I will give you a brief introduction here. So if you have any questions, it's the moment to write it in the chat. Uh, but basically, this is not part of the core lectures, I want to say, but because the first thing you need to do is to open a terminal and start doing stuff, then I, I need to give you kind of an introduction on GNU Linux. Of course, my recommendation is like, go check on YouTube videos, Google, why should I be using Linux? Why Linux is better? Why Linux is not better than Windows or Mac OS, whatever. So usually if you try to ask me why I use Linux, you will need about two or three hours uh, if you want to really listen to my answer. So, but my recommendation is start using Linux. Your life will be much better. The only drawback is that whenever you use any other operating system, you will not believe how people is using this. For me, every time I use Windows, I want, I want to kill myself and cry because I cannot believe that most of the people in the world in 2020 is using Windows. Using, sorry, we have a question. Using C17 mean that we need to do something else that we did from the repo tutorial? No. So actually, uh, uh -huh. Uh, the standard is just uh, a convention, let's say. So you install it, a modern compiler. When you, so, if you follow the first tutorial, um, a modern compiler that supports multiple um, 
standards, sorry. So with this compiler, you can say, okay, build this program with C++11, and with the same compiler, you can do build this program with C++17. So it's just a standard. So it's not all the compilers uh, support all the standards. So if you're using, for example, Ubuntu 18.04, they have a uh, all compilers, so they don't support C++17. So they, they have some features, but not all of them, like the file system library, that is super important. And that's why I ask you to install a, a modern compiler that supports this standard. But the standard itself, it's actually not visible to the programmer always. So you just say, whenever you compile something, you say, use this standard, and then that's it. So Linux is a free, like, free and libre uh, Unix-like operating system. So it's inspired on Unix. Uh, this started like also 30, 40 years ago. So if you use Mac OS and you're used to use the terminal, then you will find some similarities. So why we say GNU slash Linux? It's because the Linux kernel is just a small part of the operating system and the rest was provided by the GNU project. So make sure you go and check it out why we need to say this. And then it's nowadays it's extremely popular. So when I started using Linux, I was a geek and people were looking weird at me because I was using this weird uh, thing. But then Android became super popular, Chrome OS, and then nowadays most of the servers are running Linux. When I say server, I, I mean like big computers out there. I know that even Microsoft, for this Azure platform, they are running servers that run Linux. So this is super fun for me, and I'm glad that Microsoft uh, accepted this fact. So there are many distributions available. You can use the one you want, of course, uh, but I will be providing just support for Ubuntu because it's the most easy, easy to use distribution. And it's the one we use on the, on, on the course, and it's the operating system I'm running right now. So this is how the Linux directory tree looks. So it's super simplistic and there is no hidden stuff. So we don't have these letters, C, V, whatever. And everything starts from root. That is basically the root directory. It's like the, the very first directory of the, of the operating system. That is basically this guy here. And then hierarchically, all the other directories or folders, call it as you want, are inside this root directory. Uh, of course, uh, what, what is the meaning of each of these folders? It's complex to explain and will take a lot of time. Usually, the only thing you want to know is that there is the user space folder that is on slash, that is root, home, and then this will be your username that in my case is ibitso. So this is basically where you will be working with your files. Then the folders in Linux uh, will always end with this uh, slash character. Uh, let's use this guy. Oops. So any folder, so any path that ends with this character will be uh, a folder. So here's one example, and then everything else. So if you don't uh, append the, the slash, then it's it's going to be a file. So I know what is this, but I know for a fact that this is a file. Then absolute paths will start with uh, the slash, and then all other paths will be relative. So what is the meaning of this? That I have all my files on my home directory, that this is on slash home slash ibitso and then slash whatever folder and then for example i have a file there that is called file.cpp and this is the full absolute path but then for example i can be working on this uh, directory called folder And then when I say folder slash uh, file, then I, I mean like from here, go to folder and then uh, the file. So this is why we call it relative path. And then make sure that you know that paths are case sensitive. So it's this file in from here, 
is not the same as this guy so these are completely different names and then the extension it's always part of the name and this is something that is super simplistic so here the extensions are not obscure like in windows where you cannot like you need to go to the properties so i never got this in windows how to do but here in linux the extension of a file is part of the name so it's basically part of a string so there is nothing weird if you want to change the extension of a file then you just rename it you don't need to do anything else so this is super simplistic and it's good so this is uh, your best friend uh, friend when you use linux is use the terminal most tasks can be done much faster from the terminal than the gui i am a terminal geek and this means that i really like to use the terminal to get my stuff done super fast uh, and then if I need to use the GUI for some reason, it's usually slower and I prefer to move fast. So make sure you press Ctrl Alt T on your Linux distribution and open a terminal and try to do stuff from here. Probably if you're starting to use Linux, my recommendation is that don't try to do the stuff you're used to do in other platforms. Uh, but try to google how to do it from the terminal and this is how you get up and running on the terminal and this is how you learn how to use it basically here are some commands to navigate through the terminal so basically uh, if you do print working directory okay let's see if i can bring up a terminal here and then uh, No. Okay. Then this cannot win. Let's do this thing and then let's open a terminal to the right. And then let's see if thing you can see from there. So basically this is my terminal. I made it look clear so it, it matches the, the rest of the colors. So if I hit here, print working directory, you will say, okay, you are working on slash home slash pizza. And then if I want to go to any directory, I can, do, I can do, for example, CD and go to documents, for example. And then uh, this is how you change the path of your system. And then, for example, if you want to list the files that it's on, are on this particular path, you should do ls. So this is the most simplistic commands you can find out there. Then this is how the commands are structured. So basically, I don't really like the, this idea of commands or because there is no such thing. So a command is basically a program and that's it. So it's not that there is a something else it's just a program that someone built for you and you have it on your system so where is this it's basically on the path so this path is a it's a variable so this guy here so if you open the terminal uh, you will see that uh, actually let's do it so if you do echo for example this is to inspect a variable and you say path this is all the directories where whenever you run a command, the shell, that is the terminal I'm running, will go to this directory and search for the program. If it's not there, it will go here or here or here. So basically that's all the magic behind the, uh, the commands. There is no such thing as commands. But because of this path variable, it gives you the ability to run the programs without having to specify the full path. So you, need, you don't need to do slash user slash bin grep, that is a common, but you can just do grep. Basically these programs will always have, or usually will have options and parameters. If you want to know what a program uh, does, just use manual and, or do the help. Um, by the way, all these slides will be available on eCampus on, on the site. So some stuff I will try to not be explaining like how to run a manual because it's not fun at all and you can do it by yourself. 
but it's on the slide because it, it belongs to this particular topic. So I want I wanted to put it here so you can uh, download the slide uh, after the lecture and try to run this on your computer. Here is an example on how to do completion. So this is something I recommend everyone to use. So especially when you start running Linux, when you press tab, uh, the, the, per, the shell, that is the terminal, will try to autocomplete what you're doing for you. So I, so some people just try to, to write like really long commands and then they press enter and say, ah, oh, this doesn't work. But then you have like, I know, like you're trying to, to execute a 50 characters command and then you don't know if you have a typo. So the best way to do this is to, like when you are typing, just press the first, uh, just type the first letters you want to type and then just tap. When you do tap, you will get an auto completion and this is much easier for you because if the terminal is doing the auto completion for you, this means that whatever comes after the auto completion, it's right. So you're sure that your command is working. Here I put you like a brief of the commands uh, you need to work with files and folders, like how to create a directory, how to remove a directory, how to copy a file or move a file from one place to another. And one thing uh, I will recommend you to do is to, after this video, go to this placeholder um, slide and there is a small exercise here and this, that's basically in how to use this placeholder that is basically special characters that will give you ability to work with files easily. So I will just mention one example and then this is my shell and then let's say that uh, I want to list all the PDF files that are in here because I want to see the names. So basically, if you see here, this is my full path. So I am on home student examples, play holders. And then if I do LS, I am watching all the files that are in here. And then basically when I do LS star.pdf, this star means like, give me everything, whatever you want, but with the dot .pdf, I'm saying just give me the ones that ends with dot .pdf. Of course, you can do a lot of combination with this and then you can do regular expression, but we will not uh, see this on the course, but I would recommend you to go and check it out this example. And then lastly about Linux, I decided to explain this uh, maybe really fast because I know a lot of people struggle with this and it's super simple and once you see it, you have this idea on your on your mind it's really simple to follow so basically whenever a program is running in linux uh, the linux kernel will assign three file descriptors you don't need to know what is that uh, but you need to know that you will have a standard input channel that is this guy here that we usually call it stin and then you have two output channels that will be standard output and the standard error. Usually when you print I know hello world to the to the to the monitor you're basically uh, sending this string to the standard output channel. And then the kernel reserves three file descriptor numbers that is this guy here, this guy here and this guy here for these three particular channels. What is the meaning of this is that when you run this program, basically what is running behind the scenes that is this program is taking the standard input from the keyboard, unless you specify something different. This is the standard, the default configuration. And then the standard output will be printed to the monitor and the standard error as well. So let's check out an example of this. And then for this, let me open another terminal here and then okay so let me change this size and then no not you okay i think this looks good <laughs> Okay, we're done. So, 
basically I will show you how is the workflow of this standard input and channels using a shell. So I have a directory here on my home directory. So I'm basically uh, right now I'm slash home slash ibitso. And then I know I, I have this examples directory and now I will press tab. So if I press tab on my shell with autocomplete, hitting enter, I will go into this directory. And if I do ls, I will have one binary file here that is called program because it's the same as the example. Then if you do clear, you will clear the screen of the terminal. Now how to run this program, I just do dot slash. This means that from this directory, run this program. Of course, you can autocomplete. This means tap and then you just hit enter. And then on the standard output, you will see this message that says, please enter a number. Let's do eight. And then on the standard error channel, you will have this error that the given number is eight. What is the meaning of this is that basically the keyboard by default it's going through the I don't like this yellow the keyboard is going directly through the standard input of this program and then the standard output will be printed to the monitor and the standard error as well so this is the really basics of uh, how a program works with the inputs and outputs of a program. Now let's see how to start redirecting this. And I will show you probably one example from this uh, thing. And then I will point you to a tutorial where they go deeper into this. And I highly recommend you to watch this video. Uh, the one I will recommend you later on because it's just 10 minutes. It's well explained. You, you learn it fast and it's simple. Then let's say that for some reason I want to redirect the standard output of this program to a file that is called cout.txt. How I do this? So this is a syntax, so this is not something we can change, but it's basically program and then you say one and why I say one is because the file descriptor for the standard output is one and then you will say okay, please put one into this file called cout.txt and then basically what is this going to do is like it will redirect the standard output to a file and this means that you will not see this anymore on the screen how you can check this just do program and then you say one and then you just do cout or the name of the file you want and then you just hit enter right then if you remember Right now, we should be seeing this uh, standard output, please enter, uh, uh, give me a number. But because the standard output is now being redirected to a file, you cannot see the output. So let's put 66. And you, you see here an, an error message because the standard error is still being uh, redirected to the monitor. If you list the files here, you will see that you have this C out file. And then if you inspect this file, you will see that you have this standard output, please enter a number. So that's all you need to know. Um, basically you have many other things you can do here. Like for example, redirecting the standard error to a file or doing both. My recommendation, download the slide, check the examples. It's really useful for you. And here I put you like some of the commands you need to know. So this is a must. It's like three, four, five commands that you need to know in order to work with Linux. Otherwise, you will struggle. Then when working with the shell, you can also run multiple commands uh, and then you can change this command. So one option is to use the semicolon uh, or the ampersand. This basically this is super easy. It's basically you have three commands you want to run. And for example, in this case, this means run command one. I don't, I don't know what's happening after this command one. I don't care. Just run the command two after all and then command three. So that's what this syntax is uh, doing. Then this other syntax that is actually super useful is like the double ampersand is basically run the command one and then run the command two if the first command succeeded. What is the meaning of this? If command one gives you an error, then you will abort the complete thing. 
And then about piping, so piping itself is a topic on when you work with Linux, but basically, if you remember these examples, for example, so whenever you say, okay, the keyboard, it's feeding to the standard input of a program, when you do piping, you're basically, in this case, so the standard output of command one is being fed to the standard input of the command two. And that's why it's, it's like a pipe. So the output of command one, instead of being print to the file or the monitor, you are injecting this standard output to the standard input of our program. So basically, if you go to this guy, this example, so let's say, if you remove this, then this is, this is where the, the standard input will come when you do piping from another program. So you're not taking the input from the keyboard itself, but from the output of another program. And basically, if I would recommend you, this is the video I was mentioning before. It's basically 10 minutes videos on how to work with pipes in Linux and redirection. Make sure you go and check it out. 10 minutes, you learn it. That's it. It's super easy. You should not struggle with its small details. Okay. And lastly, I, I am putting here a link to a bash tutorial. So bash is the terminal you will be using most likely, but if you install Ubuntu and then you open a terminal, you are using bash for sure. And this is a, this is a bit longer, so it's a one hour video. Uh, but the thing is, if you spend one hour in this video, my guarantee is that you will learn all the stuff you need to know about Bash. So for this particular week on Friday, so this is your task. You need to watch this video and you need to stop the. So you need to watch the video on YouTube and then have a terminal at the side. And then you stop the video whenever you say, okay, this is happening and then you run the commands and this is how you get used to the terminal and this is how you learn. So uh, that's your task for this Friday. Just check out uh, the, this video. Their video is optional, the one from Pipes. So this is optional. It's also highly recommended. But the task for your Friday is to make sure you check this video and go through A to B. It's one hour. It's all the things you need to know. Any questions about Linux? So this was a super short interaction on how to work with the terminal, like really short, really fast. Uh, the only way to learn how to do it is using the terminal. So there is no black magic, no funky stuff, nothing. Just go open the terminal, use it. There is nothing really bad that it can happen from a command that is run on the terminal. Okay. So it's okay. What is the difference between standard error and output channel? Okay. So there is no real difference. Let's put the picture here. Um, the thing is actually on the 10 minutes video, I point you out. There is a good, uh, example of why you want to have separate things. But it's basically to split uh, the water and say, okay, I will have a standard output where I will print like message that they are not really important. But I also want to have control of this and print error message to another channel. And for example, if you write a program with this example, uh, where you have uh, a file that is, so this file will, will have the content of the errors of your program. So this is something that you might want to do. And this is a matter of flexibility. If you will have, you can have one channel if you want. So the Linux kernel could be built this way. But then whenever you have, uh, you will have all mixed like outputs with errors all on the same channel. Other thing you, you might want to do is this example. Let's say you're running a program and this program is printing a lot of information like debugging, pa, 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 a lot of stuff. And then in the middle of the program, you know that there is an error. But then you, you cannot see because it's like you have like 50,000 lines of messages. 
And then you say, okay, I will redirect the standard output to a file because I don't want to see this now. I can see this later and I only want to see the errors. And this probably, instead of like having 50,000 lines of debug information, you will only see the errors, like error, like this is happening. And this is a matter of flexibility. So there is another question. So people who is using a Windows subsystem for Linux, so do all commands work the same way on the Windows subsystem system for Linux? The answer is yes, because uh, the thing that you run when you're using this trick that Microsoft is doing is you're basically running a Linux distribution inside Windows. So it's basically a virtual machine. It's not, but it's basically that. So the program that you're running that is basically called Bash, that is the one that runs on the terminal, uh, cannot distinguish that his uh, Windows or Linux is just... So for the purpose of the shell, uh, it's like you are tricking the, the program and the program thing is Linux. So basically you can safely um, copy paste any commands that you see for Linux on the Windows subsystem for Linux and it should work. And if not, it's because uh, Microsoft is not doing something properly, but it's basically the same. So one thing you need to know is, this is important, that we want to teach you everything about C++. So uh, C++ is a big language, it's amazing, um, but it's, it's complex and it's big. So I would say that if you really want to learn everything about C++, like for real, you probably need two years, but this is if you really plan to be like a C++ full-time developer. Running the basics and the core techniques, I think with six months it's okay. Uh, but of course you need to keep in mind that uh, we, we can't teach you everything about C++. And of course if you have any ideas, feedback or like all your questions during this course will uh, make this class uh, more fun for everyone else. So maybe you say Nacho, when I was blah, 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 doing this project, we used this other feature of C++ and I think it's better. And this is really good because then we can discuss like this feature if you think it's better. So it's really impossible for me to teach you everything about C++. One, because I don't know everything about C++. I think no one knows. And then because it's going to take forever. So keep this, keep this in mind where we will be writing this beautiful C++ code. So basically you have two options. One is to use an IDE. Of course, the people who knows how I think, this is not recommended at all. This is the worst idea you can do, especially if you're learning. So whenever you use IDEs for learning, this will, of course, it's much more comfortable. Everything is working, but then you will miss all the magic of the what is going behind the scenes. And when you learn, you need to know this behind the scenes. So on this course, we will go for the behind the scenes that are actually not that hard. And then you will learn how to work besides an IDE. And then we will use in modern text editor. My recommendation is that you can use whatever you want. We, we will probably use in Visual Studio Code. So this is a text editor that is modern and it's open source. It's supported by Microsoft um, and has a lot of cool features. I also have a short explanation of why you should be using text editors and not IDEs uh, on the website. So make sure you check that out. Uh, but it's basically, this will give you the ability to learn more, to learn the behind the scenes, also we give you the flexibility to work whenever and whatever you want. So if you go for like big companies, it's really hard that you will find some of these companies using these IDEs because the IDEs are fine, but for a small project or for projects that are like the scope of the project is not extremely big. Whenever you start like going bigger, this text, this IDEs like Eclipse will just crash or we, we need to use like half of your computer and many other reasons. So again, go, make sure you go and check it out the website. And if you have any uh, 
concerns or if you have any opinion on this we can discuss this on the chat we can make a discussion say no let's use IDEs are much better I'm quite sure I will have like a lot of arguments to beat your your complaint but I'm happy to to discuss this if you if you need to another thing is like there is this guy called Bean that is super hard to use but my recommendation if you really plan to build a career in robotics is that whenever you have time probably now because of the coronavirus start learning it's just a te text editor but the thing is it's super fast to use the text editor is fast uh, it's hacky you will feel like you are working on the 70s but people still use it nowadays in 2020 including myself and then whenever you work with remote servers or with robots you will love the fact that you know how to use Beam. otherwise you will be suffering so you can use text editors on remote machines but when these machines are not super powerful or the net or the net connection is a bit slow then you will suffer a lot so make sure you you spend some time learning beam or any other similar tool if you want so this is the simplest program that will print hello world uh, so this is super easy let's go back into the history and let's see the assembly code for this example here so this is the same program and this is the assembly code and then ah, <laughs> I missed that one this is the uh, hello world for the C++ so basically uh, here oops. so here you have the line that does all the magic that is basically put this string that we put it inside hello world to the standard output and you know that if this program is running without any redirection it's going to print this to the, the monitor and then this std end line it's basically saying okay print a new line when you end this stream we will go uh, we will discuss this syntax and these double dots uh, starting next week for now this is the very first program you will see and believe me that this is a lot so actually when you start for let's say that you're working with a new robot uh, and then you have a you know a new uh, embedded Linux board whatever so making this hello world example just to run sometimes takes months so hello world example it's super simple doesn't do anything really fancy but it's a lot actually so let's okay let's build this let's build this example so for that i will open a terminal and then i will go to the examples for example and then i will create a new directory and i will call it hello world example and then here my recommendation is that so I, I have seen people using text editors uh, like an IDE so the tendency is that people will now want to open the text editor and then start coding my recommendation is try to do everything from the terminal and then create a separate directory you know where this directory are and then once you have your workspace set up then you open the text editor so we have this new directory we will go into this directory for that we do cd and then here we don't have anything and this is fine and then we will do code and then dot right and then this will open a text editor on the screen on this particular directory and this is my recommendation is that you always do like this let's close this terminal and then if you see open editors so there is nothing here so this is visual studio code uh, with the setup and the recommendations i gave to you on the wiki basically i think if, yeah you can do file new file here and then just save this file and let's call it hello world.cpp one thing i really like about text editors that i 
extremely dislike about IDEs is that here, basically, you will have uh, the files that are on this particular directory. I, I remember that whenever I work, work with, with Eclipse, you have folders and these folders are projects and you also have header files that are for, from the system and then you don't know where is what. So here you only see one, one file that is this hello world. And then if we want to reproduce this hello world example, this is fun because when you do these live coding examples, nothing works. So let's see. And then you just type include. We will discuss this in a minute. IO stream. And then we will write this function. We call it main. And then we will say, okay, print hello modern. Here we will use people who already know uh, C++. I'm sorry if it's, this is really boring for you, but we need to go through these small details. Okay, let's save this file. Actually, let's add a comment here and say this prints uh, the output to the monitor. Right, so this is your first program. This is a text file. So if you go and print this, you will see on the paper just text. So there's nothing there still. For this, you need to compile this. And then in order to do that, you will open a terminal. In Visual Studio Code, you can open a terminal with him, the, the text editor. Of course, you can open a separate terminal if it's up to you. This is the same terminal, oh, sorry that we were using before. If I do ls, I only see one file. And how I build this on Linux with our configuration, you should do C++ and then you will type hello. And then you can do tab, for example, to autocomplete and then you just hit enter. This will compile your program. And then if you list the files that are in here, now you will see this new file that is called a.out. That is basically the program that is the executable. So if I execute this program, you will see hello modern C++, right? And of course I can redirect this output instead of in the screen and say, okay, the standard output, I want to put it here to standard STD out. And then you don't see the, the output, but actually you have a new file here. It's called STD out that has hello modern C++. And this second line is basically this guy here that is the end line, right? Super simple. It's a lot because this means that your setup is working. So this is the hello wall of the C++ examples. Something that is important, it's comments. Whenever you write uh, source code, you can add comments. Again, the philosophy nowadays is to write code that speaks for itself and not the comments. So. Basically, this, whatever follows this double slash will be a comment. So this is completely ignored. And whatever is between these two guys, that is basically a C style comment will be also ignored. So I will highlight you here, the parts of the program that you can actually write whatever you want here and will be completely ignored. One thing I probably forgot to mention is that C++ is a compiled language. And what is the meaning of this? It's the same as C. Instead of writing assembly code, we will write a high level language and then we will use another program that we call the compiler. But in our course, it's the Clang compiler, but it can be GCC, can be the Intel compiler, the Microsoft compiler, whatever compiler for C++. And this, then this compiler will turn this uh, C++ code into assembly code. And this is really important because this is there is a big difference between interpreted language like Python or MATLAB and C++. We will discuss some benefits later on in the course, but one of the big benefits is that you know before you run the program if there is some error on the program. People who already work with Python, uh, they know it's an interpreted language, so they will ex be executing instructions by instructions. And then if you hit an error, then you realize that you have an error 
when you hit that line. C++ will compile the program first, and if there is no error, we'll give you an executable, that is the, the program itself, and then when you run this, it will run binary code, so you don't know like what is running, it's just assembly code. So if you inspect this program, it's really hard to make a sense out of it. And this is one of the reasons why it's super fast. So this, the comments are simply ignored. And then about styling, it's super important. And this year I decided to not be that tolerant like in previous years, so we will be using a tool uh, we have a we will have a tutorial on these tools uh, coming soon that is called client format that will format your code and the idea behind this is that programs are meant to be read by humans and only incidentally for computers to execute so nowadays in 2020 there is no good reason why sh you should not follow a particular coding style or a formatting style uh, because it's really easy you don't really need to do anything and it's going to make your code look better and it's going to be easy for others to read. So don't worry about this. So if you follow my setup on how to set up the, your dev machine, you already have these tools. And for example, if you see this example, if, if I try to write like really ugly code like this, whenever I save this program, it will auto format the program and this is also happening on your machine so if i do ctrl s for save boom this is now it's reformat in a better way so this is important for me and it will be important for you because if your programs when you submit the homework are not in a formatting style uh, your homework will not pass the the checks we will discuss this later on and then the last thing we will discuss about this hello world is that every C++ program will start with the main. So this is this is not something optional. This is not something that depends on Linux or Windows, wherever. This is a fact. Every C++ program starts with main. You're checking a project. It has 50,000 files. You want to know where the project starts, go and check the main function. This is not a function you define, it's defined in the language, so you cannot change the name. You cannot say, you know what, I want that the main that my program starts with the function called Posecito. You can't do this. You just need to use main. So main is a function like that will return an error call. Basically, on Linux, there are 255 error codes, but basically error zero means that everything is okay, and wherever it's not zero, it's an error. So if you remember when we were changing commands with the double ampersand, and I say, okay, if command one doesn't give you an error, then follow command two, this error is basically the return, the return code of the, of the program. And then when, whenever you hit include, so we will have probably next week a full lecture on build systems, you're basically saying, please give me whatever is inside this file, just put it here. So I will show you how this works. Don't be scared. It's, so because of the content of this file, it, it might be scary. But this include iOS 3 is doing something really easy. It's basically going to this file that if you go to this file, it's this guy, just forget this. It's copy pasting, so I'm selecting everything here, and then this include will be replaced with the paste of this guy. So basically doing include and copy paste the code from other files into your program is the same. There is no difference. But why we do this? Because now this is like not too much source code, but let's say that you have multiple includes then you have like all files of 50,000 lines so of course this is not the best way to do it but actually if you run this try to compile this program again okay we have a warning but actually let's remove the standard output text and the program nothing is here let's compile this and actually you have an executable so it's the same you run this, you have hello more in C++, nothing really changed. So basically make sure that, just remember that whenever you do include and then you do iostream, 
you're only copy pasting whatever is on the IO stream file inside this particular file. And then last but not least, if you so if you're really anxious and you want to try out stuff, uh, here's an example on how to work with the channels, the input channel, the standard output channel, and the standard error. Um, actually, let's let's write this program down. Uh, and my recommendation is that you write this program on your own, and then you you play with the examples on the um, of the redirection that is on the slide. So I, I gave you four examples. Of course, there are more combinations you can do, but make sure you run this program this afternoon, this this tonight if you have time, and make sure you run these guys and to to see an example. So basically, ah, another thing, all the programs you will see on the slides, they are basically, so I built these programs before putting on the slide. So they're always uh, working. So you can like safely copy paste the, the code from the slides. So let's do the following. Let's create a variable here. Let's call my var. And then let's put a zero, it's a good idea to initialize. And then let's say, okay, uh, give me your best number, right? This will print, give me your best number to the standard output. And then if you check the slide, you will see that the syntax, syntax to get uh, input from the standard input is this one. It's the same as the, the C out, but with the stream operator, um, the other way around. So basically, you will do whatever is coming to the standard input. This means stdc in, just put it into my var. And then let's print to the error, to the standard error. Error. This is not your best number. And then if we compile this again, so C++, hello world. And then whenever we run this program, we we'll get give me your best number. And you say, okay, my best number is 900. And I said, ah, error. This is not your best number. And this, you see both outputs, standard output, standard error to the monitor, because that's the default. But let's say I don't want to see the errors right now. Okay, let's redirect the standard error channel to error txt, and then let's run this. Give me your best number, 500. No error message. Why? Because instead of being redirected to the monitor, it's on the, this new file that is error. This is not your best number. So make sure you check out this example and that's it. So this, this is uh, basically the, the process of uh, compilation. So we humans understand, understand text and that's why we write in these high level languages. My computers only can get machine code that is basically uh, binary code. So the compilation, this process is a translation from the text that is basically your hello world.cpp program into machine code. And who is doing this? The compiler, that is another program. Compilers that you can use in Linux are many of them. This year I switched to Clang. Uh, my, my heart still belongs to GCC, that is the compiler from the GNU project. But the LLM, LLVM project that is maintained by, by Apple is doing a great job on tools. So, and I think you, we, we need to have better tools uh, in order to, to, to work better with C++. I also want to give credits to Igor the Great. So Igor is the person who started uh, this course and it's an awesome guy and awesome teacher. So my recommendation that given the fact that uh, we already have lectures for previous year uh, courses. So if there's anything that you didn't understand from my side, just go and check it out. The YouTube videos from Igor, maybe you can get the ideas from there. And also I would say that 80% of the slides were made by Igor. So basically we are reusing the slides from Igor. So Igor, uh, thank you very much. And I wanted to give credits to him. This is, uh, some people already saw this video, but this is something I tend to do on my lecture. So every time I'm finishing a lecture, 
and this case is half an hour late so I'm sorry uh, we have two hours but I wanted to make it one hour but I couldn't make it so the idea is that whenever I finish a lecture I want to give you a video that I think it's related to the lecture that that is not mandatory for the course so in this case it's a TEDx talk on why you should learn how to program so you can watch this video you can it's up to you so again I put this here it's on the slides you will have it on eCampus the book you you might want to use as reference is the C++ programming language so it's a really small book it's like this size it's like 13,000 pages it's because it's basically like a manual it's not like a book to read in in the bed so Bian Storstrup the creator of C++ is the one who wrote this book so always there is uh, this is usually the best source you can get if you want to learn C I would recommend you to use the Kenyan Richie C book language that is again from the creators of C in our course we will use this book we will I don't I mean I don't ask you to go and buy it or get it online but if you don't understand some concepts it's probably a good idea to get, go and check it out there probably the best reference for any other small question you have is CBB, CBB reference so I put you the link here so just click it go there and you will see probably most of the things you you need to know are here the examples are here so it's a really good reference and then that's basically it so I will give you five more minutes if you have any questions if you have any questions on probably on the organization of the course or whatever you we can also discuss this offline um, next lecture will be next Wednesday same hour same channel if you have any recommendation or any positive feedback I would love to know uh, this is the first time I'm doing YouTube live streams so just hit me and say I really like the live stream I think Zoom is better this is better just you can just write to the discord channel and then we can try to, to make the, the best usage of the tools for us In terms of tasks for you, so you, you have some tutorials that I gave you reference on this slide. The slide will be online. And then also you need to install Linux on your machine or use WSL on Windows. Most of you should know this information, so you already should have everything installed. So actually you can, after this lecture, you can go and, che and check the examples by your own, like the examples we saw on this slide, when I, I upload this slide. And then for Friday, you can check this bash tutorial. If you have any questions, we can discuss it on the Discord channel. And next week, we will be discussing about build systems and core C++ language. And I will give you the first homework you need to do.